we are committed to identify and address opportunities uh, to advance equity uh, and inclusion at every point of our work. And as members of the medical community, we have a unique role uh, to impact the health of our community. It's this unique role that helps guide the strategic initiatives for the School of Medicine, uh, which includes investment in our community and coordinating uh, public and private partnerships with our community. I'd like to especially point out um, an effort that will be um, operationalized over the next few months, and that's the Cleveland Population and Community Health Initiative led by the School of Medicine and its many uh, faculty. Um, and we intend to make this uh, have significant and generational impact on the health of our community. We will partner with community residents to address the social determinants of health through a combination of community engaged research, education, training, preclinical care activities to benefit our community and their well being. And we will be doing this with many of the organizations and individuals in our various neighborhoods, whether it be Huff Gar uh, or, uh, and others. And uh, we intend to improve the health of our community um, and uh, lead to their better employment and frankly expect longer life expectancies in the city. So how can each of us relate to Martin Luther King Day and its importance across America? The 1619 Project reminds us that history, the recounting and understanding of past events, is an ongoing education for all of us, and that we did not appreciate, recognize, or count uh, the embedded impact of our Black Americans in our societal advances. I recently completed the book, These Truths, A History of the United States uh, by Jill Lepore, which emphasizes completely different things than I learned when I took history in high school and college and threaded throughout is a profound impact both on our black community as builders, educators, and leaders, but also the impact negative of systemic racism, redlining, and suppression of diverse voices. As we commemorate and look ahead to Black History Month, it's important to acknowledge that while strides are being made, um, healthcare in America, our business, falls short of our ideal to deliver equity in healthcare to train a diverse uh, workforce that reflects our community and our populations in need. To help us along this path, I can think of no one better to serve as our keynote speaker today than Dr. Capers, who is a national leader in diversifying uh, the medical field. In his words, diversity in medicine saves lives. Dr. Capers led the first study to document the extent of unconscious bias in medical school admissions He's delivered more than 200 lectures on implicit bias and mitigation workshops around the country. During his tenure as Dean for admissions at the Ohio State College of Medicine from 2009 to 2019, his school had the second highest enrollment of black students among the 152 medical schools in the country. In 2020, Dr. Capers joined the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center he is the Rhody P. Cox MD professor and serves as the inaugural vice chair for diversity and inclusion in the Department of Medicine and is the associate dean for faculty diversity. <clears throat> Dr. Capers grew up wanting to be a physician. After graduating from the pre-med program at Howard University, he received his medical degree at Ohio State University, a residency in medicine at Emory University, a fellowship in cardiovascular medicine, there and uh, vascular uh, biology research. And he currently is uh, an ongoing practitioner, uh, renowned expert in interventional cardiology. But Dr. Capers also grew up in Cleveland. He was born a stone's throw from here at Forest City Hospital in the Cleveland Glenville neighborhood. Um, he calls that hospital's very existence a revolutionary act because Forest City Hospital was founded by black doctors equal to have control over the uh, treatment of their patients, uh, which frankly was not possible in the other facilities in, uh, and hospitals at that time. When it opened in 1957 until it closed its doors in the late 70s, Forest City was known as the place where black Clevelanders went for better health care. 
While access to health care has improved in the decades since, our physicians and medical researchers do not reflect the diversity of our community. As a result, we are not attentive to the many diseases and conditions and adverse social determinants of health that harm minority communities at a disproportionately higher rate. As we commemorate Dr. King and Black History Month, let us be reminded that these disparities are unacceptable. It's our responsibility as healthcare providers and educators to work against uh, them at every moment. Today will be a great learning opportunity. We'll hear from one of the country's foremost experts in advancing health equity. I'm really excited to present and look forward to the conversation with Dr. Uh, Quinn Capers. Dr. Gerson, thank you so very much for, uh, first of all, for your comments, which are, are very timely and, and really do uh, speak to uh, where we are and where we need to go. Um, uh, and then thank you also for your uh, warm uh, and kind introduction uh, of me. Um, I am, uh, and thank you, it sounds like somebody did their, their research there. You, you said a little bit about uh, Forest City Hospital and where I was born. and. Somewhere in my archives, I have a, a, a picture that's very valuable to me. It's uh, me shaking hands with, I actually went back to Cleveland the summer before I started medical school and met the doctor who delivered me. So I'm shaking hands with the OBGYN that delivered me. And uh, uh, that uh, that is very special to me as is uh, Cleveland uh, will always be in my heart. So again, sorry, I couldn't be there with you in person, uh, but I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with you. Uh, and your colleagues, your faculty, student, and staff. So um, uh, let's start with uh, with a, a declarative uh, statement uh, regarding health equity. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, the lack of diversity in medicine is an important driver of the health inequities and of healthcare disparities. And we in medicine, medicine is a wonderful thing, but we will never reach our full potential to alleviate suffering and improve lives until as a profession, we leverage talent from all backgrounds. And uh, I wanna spend a few minutes talking to you about the connection between diversity, diversity in the physician workforce, diversity in the healthcare workforce and health equity. So what is the, what is the connection? It's important that you understand that because uh, if you are like me, and I suppose you are, if you have uh, logged onto this meeting and you think that diversity in medicine is a good thing and you often talk about that, well, occasionally you will be challenged Right. Occasionally, you'll have a colleague or a coworker or someone challenge you and ask you simply, why? Why? Why do we need more diversity in medicine? Why should diversity in medicine be something that we strive, uh, that we strive for, uh, that we work towards? Um, and, you know, it's been interesting uh, as I've and I've been coast to coast talking about this as I watch doctors uh, who might occasionally be challenged after saying we need to enhance diversity. You know, if it's a surgeon, if it's a cardiologist, if it's a psychiatrist, they can readily quote to you all the literature in their field backing up why they use this medicine versus that medicine. But if you ask them, why should we strive for diversity in medicine? They kind of get tongue tied. So I wanna, I wanna have this conversation with you so that, that you uh, understand that this is what the evidence shows. This isn't just Quinn Capers uh, opinion. So uh, I'll start this uh, here. So I am uh, I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter, and you know I, I understand that social media can be used for good purposes or for evil purposes. I use it for good purposes. One of the things I like about Twitter is that you can create these polls, and you can kind of see uh, how at least your followers feel about a certain topic. So so I asked this question: uh, Why do we need diversity in medicine? I wanted to see kind of what my followers thought about this, and uh, here's how I framed the question. I said, if a colleague asked me, why do we need more diversity in medicine? I would have a strong evidence supported answer. And then I gave a semi Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. As you can see, 75% said either agree or strongly disagree. 25% said either disagree or strongly disagree. And that's out of a thousand voters. And then we got some comments and let me share some of those comments with you. So this one, uh, I know I'm showing his face, but that's okay, Carl and I, we went to medical school together at Ohio State. He's a friend, so he doesn't mind me uh, showing his identity here. And Carl, who is a pulmonary critical care specialist, said this. He said, I put disagree because while I agree with the premise that diversity is good in medicine, I don't have the data in my field 
pulmonary critical care medicine? Someone else said, it's a great question. I definitely support it, but my support of diversity is based on experience and the population I serve, but I lack knowledge of the academic evidence to make my argument. Uh, someone else said, it's an interesting question, uh, but um, uh, I really couldn't quote the data or the literature. So I want you to be able to make the argument for diversity and quote the data and the literature. And so I put it now to you, this question to you uh, in the form of a multiple choice question. And I just want you thinking about now, if someone were to ask you, you know, if you walked into uh, the doctor's lounge or um, uh, your place of worship or wherever your place of work, and you said, you know what, we just, we need more diversity in medicine. And somebody challenged you and said, why? Why do we need more diversity in medicine? Be thinking about this. Would you have an evidence supported answer to your question? So I'm gonna put it to you now in the form of a multiple choice question uh, because uh, you know uh, that is the teacher in me. So with this multiple choice question, why do we see diversity in medicine? As you know, because you've taken and done well on a lot of tests and quizzes and exams before, the best way to approach a multiple choice question is to cross out the incorrect answers, cross out the ones that you know are incorrect, right? And then maybe you're left with one or two and you kind of got to use your noggin to tell uh, which one it is. So this is a single best answer type multiple choice question. Why do we seek diversity in medicine? Is it because A, physicians who train in diverse environments rate themselves as more comfortable treating minority patients? Maybe it's B, because underrepresented minority physicians are more likely to serve the underserved. Maybe the answer is C, because minority patients are more likely to follow the recommendations of minority physicians. Maybe D is the answer, diversity in medicine will help us reduce racial healthcare disparities. Or maybe it's E, because diversity on our research teams can enhance the impact and the reach of the research. So this is a single best answer type multiple choice question. I'm gonna give you some background to help you. So I want you to, I want you to do well on this quiz. I want you to get the right answer. Uh, and so as we go through, I want you to cross out the incorrect answers in your mind uh, so that we're left with the, uh, with the correct answer. So let me give you some background information. Here's a, a study done in 2008 by Saha and colleagues. And what they did was they uh, surveyed graduating medical students, fourth year medical students, and they asked them how comfortable they were treating patients who belong to a group, a demographic group other than their own. They then did something interesting. They uh, uh, went back and looked at the compositional diversity of the student body where these uh, young doctors went to medical school. And what they found is that there was a positive association between the diversity in the student body and that doctors comfort treating uh, diverse individuals or individuals from different backgrounds. In the comments, they said that in this cohort of more than 20,000 graduating medical students, white students who attended more racially diverse schools rated themselves as better prepared than students at less diverse schools to care for racial and ethnic minority patients. And so it appears, this isn't the only study to show this, but it does appear that training in a diverse environment the diverse milieu improves everybody's cultural humility and cultural competency. So I know some of you are feeling good about A as the answer, but let's continue. Uh, what I wanna show you now is an analysis from the AAMC of surveys that are given to first year medical students and fourth year medical students. So uh, if you uh, are, are a physician who attended a double AMC medical school, you may not remember it, but your first week, orientation week, you know, you were excited, there was a lot going on, but sometime during that first week, you sat down and took a survey. You also may not remember your last week of medical school because it was graduation week, you got a lot going on, but you also sat down and took a survey. And uh, there are several questions on that survey where you are asked first year, fourth year, the exact same question. And this analysis looks at the answer to a particular question. And the question is, when you are finished training, do you plan to locate your practice in an underserved area and serve underserved patients? Well, 
80,000 medical students uh, were in this analysis and they found off the bat that black and Hispanic students were more likely to answer yes to that question than white and Asian students. And this is upon entry to medical school. This is the first week of medical school. There were a significant number of students who were undecided. There were three choices, yes, no, or undecided. So then they looked back uh, at those same students when they were graduating from medical school and they focused on those who were undecided. Here's what they found. They found that black and Hispanic students that were initially undecided were more likely to answer yes by graduation. And they found that white and Asian students that were initially undecided were more likely to answer no by graduation. So isn't that, isn't that interesting? So you think about that, for those who are undecided regarding that question, do you plan to practice in an underserved area and serve underserved patients? For the Blacks and Hispanics that were initially undecided, something happens during the four years of medical school that has them by their senior year saying yes. And for the white and Asian students in this analysis who were initially undecided, <laughs> something happens during that four years of medical school that has them by the end saying, no, uh, I don't think uh, I will practice uh, in an underserved area. So this is entering the profession. For this next slide here, I'm on the same topic, but now um, um, I am showing you practice patterns after doctors have completed medical school and residency and fellowship if necessary, and they're actually practicing. I had a goal with this slide and I fell short of my goal. My goal was to put on one slide, every study that has ever shown that black, Hispanic and American Indian physicians are more likely to serve underserved populations, to serve underserved communities, to provide charity care, et cetera. And I fell short of my goal because the slide wasn't big enough. So you have to settle for these 10 studies all showing the same thing, that doctors from underrepresented minority backgrounds are more likely than others to serve the underserved. So they come into medical school with that in their heart, and it's not just talk. When they graduate, they actually go on to serve the underserved at higher rates. That's important, we'll come back to that. So some of you might feel good about B as the answer, but let's continue. What you're looking at here, the photographs, are what we call photographs of standardized physicians, right? So you know what standardized patients are. Those are actors playing the role of patients. Well, these are standardized doctors. These are actors playing the role of doctors. And here they're actually playing the role of heart doctors. So um, uh, each of these actors read an identical script in a video clip. And the script they read said something to the tune of, I reviewed your tests, and I recommend that you have open heart surgery. They all said the same thing. Now these researchers gathered up actual real live patients with heart disease and had them view the videos. And after they viewed the videos, you only saw one. So if you were a patient in the study, you only saw one video. But after viewing the video, they were asked some questions. One of the questions was, well, what do you think? Will you have the surgery based on what you heard this doctor say? The results show that uh, the black patients were more likely to agree to heart surgery if it was recommended by a black doctor as opposed to the white doctors. And there's another study out of Oakland, California where black men were the patients. This one now, not a simulation. And these black male patients were randomized to having either a black male doctor, a white male doctor, or an Asian male doctor. All the doctors recommended the same thing, a blood glucose test, a blood cholesterol test, and a flu vaccination. And the results showed that the black men were more likely to have all three of those if they were recommended by a black doctor as opposed to a white or Asian doctor. So that means if you're counting, if we had more black doctors, more minority patients would get their blood sugar checked, would get their cholesterol checked, and would get their vaccination and would have major open heart surgery if necessary. And so I'm betting that some of you feel good about C as the answer, but let's keep going. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna get, and I apologize, I'm gonna get a little cardiology centric now for those of you who may not work in cardiology, but it's to make a point. And um, 
what I want you to do is take a look at these two patients. And I tell you that they both have very weak hearts. They are both at risk for what we call cardiac arrest, which means the heart just stops. We're lucky to live in a time where we have technology that can save the lives of patients who are at risk for cardiac arrest. It's called an automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It's like having an emergency room in your chest. It's a small device that fits in your chest, monitors your heart rhythm, and if your heart stops, boom, it shocks your heart to get it going again. These two patients are both at risk for sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest. Who gets the device? I'm sure in your mind you're saying, well, both, obviously. But that is not what is happening across the United States of America. Across the USA, with the same diagnosis, the white man is more likely to receive the defibrillator than the black woman. Let's continue. I'm staying cardiology centric, but I'm making a point. Let's talk about heart attacks, or the medical term we use is acute coronary syndromes. That's where the artery supplying heart muscle suddenly closes off, depriving the heart muscle of blood and oxygen, leading to heart muscle death and often death of the patient. What we know in my specialty, interventional cardiology, is that the sooner we get that patient to the cath lab and do an angiogram, identify the blocked artery and open it, restoring blood flow to the heart muscle, the more heart muscle we are likely to salvage, the more likely we are to save that patient's life. So time is muscle, is what we say, meaning that time is of the essence. The sooner you go, the more heart muscle you save, the more likely you are to save the patient. And I want you to look at these two patients. And my question to you, they're both having a heart attack, is which of them gets timely cardiac intervention? And I'm pretty sure in your mind, you're saying, well, of course, both of them. But that's not what's happening in this United States of America. In the United States of America, national data shows that the white man is more likely to get timely cardiac intervention than the black man, even when they have the same diagnosis. One more example, critical lower extremity ischemia or poor circulation in the legs. Data shows that when these two patients, and I want you to look at them, look them in the face. These two patients, when they present with an ischemic foot, a cold foot that's blue because of lack of blood flow and gangrene hasn't quite set in, but it's close, who will get timely procedure where they have an angiogram and then an angioplasty or a bypass surgery to restore blood to the leg and who will get an amputation? I'm sure in your mind, you're saying that they both should get the very best care available. And I agree with you, but that is not what's happening across this nation of ours. Across this nation, the white man is more likely to have a procedure to restore blood flow. The black man is more likely to be referred for an amputation. I hope I've convinced you that there is a problem. What I wanna tell you is that that problem uh, is not new. Not only is it not new, uh, it's not hidden. Scholars have written about these racial healthcare disparities for now four decades. The first papers to show disparities along racial lines in the use of cardiovascular procedures to treat heart attacks, to treat heart failure, and to treat lower extremity poor circulation started appearing in the 90s. And according to the latest PubMed search uh, I did, the most recent one was last year, a couple of months ago, 2022. So we've had four decades of scholarly papers documenting these racial healthcare disparities and not much has changed. In this review article we wrote we talked about in a certain 20 year period, there were 300 papers, 300 documenting just in cardiology, these black white disparities. Yet things were just as bad at the end of that 20 year period and documenting the problem 300 times as they were at the beginning of that period. So documenting the problem is not fixing the problem. I am of the mind, as are other experts in the field, that we won't really move the needle 
in reducing these healthcare disparities until we move this needle. We have a diversity problem in medicine. We have a diversity problem in cardiology. I serve as the chair of the American College of Cardiology's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and we know this is a problem. We're working hard on it. Here are the current stats. While 51% of American adults identify as women, only 13% of cardiologists are women. While 17% of adult, uh, adults in America identify as Hispanic, only 5% of cardiologists are Hispanic. And while 13 to 14% of Americans identify as Black or African American, not even 3% of cardiologists are Black or African American. This, we think, is a root problem to healthcare disparities and health inequities. And so I'm sure there are some of you that feel good about D as the answer. Let's continue. I love this paper written by Al Shibli and colleagues in 2018, where they tested their hypothesis that diversity on the research team, racial diversity on the research team might have something to do with the ultimate impact of the research. So they did a lot of reading. They analyzed 9 million papers um, and they studied the relationship between the impact of the research, which they defined as the number of times the paper was cited in the literature. Now, if you're a researcher, you want your research findings to be known broadly widely, you want them cited in other papers. This is really important to a researcher. They looked and see to see if there was a relationship between different types of diversity, diversity of age, diversity of gender, et cetera, and research impact. And the strongest was racial and ethnic diversity. So that means if you're listening here and uh, uh, you are primarily a researcher, you want your research to have uh, impact and to be cited widely and read by a lot of people, then take a look at your research team. You want some racial diversity on your research team. So now, remember this was a single best answer type multiple choice question. So what is the answer? Why do we seek diversity in medicine? Is it A, because physicians who train in a diverse environment are more comfortable treating minority patients? Is it B, underrepresented minority physicians are more likely to serve the underserved? Is it C, minority patients are more likely to follow the recommendations of minority physicians? Is it D, that diversity will help reduce racial healthcare disparities? And maybe the answer is E, because diversity will enhance the impact of research. So Case Western Reserve University and affiliate institutions, what is the answer? So I'm sure you've figured out by now that the answer is all of the above. Okay? All of these statements are true. And so now I hope that you feel like you have a strong evidence-supported answer to the question, why diversity? Why diversity? So if all these things are true, uh, uh, I've got another question for you. That's, well, well, then why aren't we there yet? If this is true and it's known and the literature supports it, why aren't we there yet? We are proud to say we practice evidence-based medicine. I follow the evidence. Uh, if a pharmaceutical sales rep comes to me and says, hey, Dr. Capers, uh, stop using this drug to prevent stroke in your patients and start using this one because it's better. The first thing I'm gonna say is, well, show me the data. If you show me the data that supports that, then I will change my practice because I'm proud to say I follow the evidence. Well, there's evidence that diversity makes things better. So why are we not following the evidence and doing everything we can to diversify medicine? Uh, one reason is this, is because uh, not everybody believes uh, that uh, diversity will make medicine better. Now that's a strong statement, but I'm gonna back that up with some data. And uh, actually, if you've been uh, incidentally anywhere on social media in the last week, you'll see that there was some uh, consternation coming out of a meeting of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. That's the National Organization of Cardiothoracic Surgeons. Uh, they had a little uh, fluff up there where an outgoing president made some statements that seemed to imply uh, that uh, he and the organization 
uh, are not uh, necessarily as pro-diversity as people in the audience would have uh, liked. Um, but this is the same organization, but this is, this is four years earlier, 2019. That organization realizing that like cardiology, they are not very diverse. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons now has a diversity and inclusion committee. And one of the first things they wanted to do was to survey their members. So they surveyed their members to see how their members feel about diversity, equity, and inclusion and the lack of diversity in cardiothoracic surgery. As, uh, as is often the case with these kinds of surveys, the real goal, the real good stuff you get is the answer to that, uh, that uh, open-ended question at the end where you say, tell me whatever you want to about this topic. And I'm gonna show you uh, some of those uh, answers. So these are responses to that answer from members of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion and the lack of diversity in cardiothoracic surgery. One person said this, uh, white, males, wow. white males are currently being discriminated against in admission to college, med school, and residency programs. Cardiothoracic surgery should be a meritocracy. Another person said, I do not believe barriers exist. This myth of the necessity of diversity and inclusiveness is political correctness on steroids. We need to worry about turning out well-trained residents. Another person said the STS doesn't need to address diversity. In fact, you know, this shouldn't even be on the radar of things to be done. And finally, someone said barriers, what barriers? There are no barriers and none of the above are important. Now I'm a cardiologist. It might not be fair for me to pick on another specialty because as I said, cardiology, we have to get our own house in order. Um, and so uh, one of the first things that we did, the diversity and inclusion committee of the American College of Cardiology was to survey cardiology fellowship program directors. These are the program directors. Remember I showed you how a few cardiologists belong uh, to certain minority groups and women. So we wanted to know how our program directors, these are the gatekeepers to the profession. You don't get to be a cardiologist unless you get past that cardiology fellowship program director and their selection committee. So we wanted to know how they feel about diversity. And so we asked questions in a survey. Uh, one of the first questions was this, diversity is a driver of excellence in healthcare delivery. In other words, the more diversity amongst your providers, the better the care delivered. Do you believe this? Well, fortunately, almost 70% said yes. 5% said, no, I don't believe that. And 25% said, maybe. So if you put together the no and the maybe, that's 30%. That's three out of 10 of the cardiology fellowship program directors that aren't sure if diversity enhances quality. The next thing we did on the survey is we gave those program directors 10 characteristics of cardiology fellowship applicants. And we said, rank these characteristics in order of their importance when you're actually making your rank list. So when you go in that room and close the door with your committee and somebody's up at the whiteboard writing the name of the candidates that you're gonna rank in order, what's on your mind? What are the most important things? Here's what we found. Uh, the top vote getter was clinical skills, acumen. I've got no problem with that and I'm sure you don't either. Number two, the second highest vote getter was ability to fit in. And I wonder if that means the same thing to you as it does to me. Ability to fit in, what does that mean exactly? And you can see the rest of them there, research productivity, strength of the recommendation letter, but let your eyes go all the way down to the bottom, all the way down to the bottom. That's where you'll find diversity slash the ability to enhance the cultural competency of the fellowship program. So it is literally and figuratively the last thing on the minds of our program directors when they make their rank list. And so um, we are a part of the problem. And then the last thing I wanna say on this is, uh, I wanna point this out to you. Maybe some of you have heard of what is now the infamous uh, Wang paper, W-A-N-G. Here you see uh, the abstract of this paper a single author paper that was published in the Journal of the American Heart Association. This single author paper, despite what the title looks like, is actually an argument against diversity in cardiology. 
There were several things said in this paper that hurt a lot of people. I had mentees calling me up saying, is this what cardiology thinks of us? Is this what the American Heart Association thinks of us? Some of the nuggets in this single author paper were one, uh, the professor said, yes, it might be true that there are not very many black and Hispanic cardiologists, but that's because they're not qualified. The second thing he said was that yes, it might be true that black and Hispanic cardiologists are more likely than cardiologists of other races to serve underserved communities and neighborhoods, but that is probably because they didn't pass their board exams. And you know, when you don't pass your board exams, you, you don't get to practice in a top hospital. You gotta go way, way out in some rural area or in some underserved urban area and practice. But you now know that Blacks and Hispanics come into medical school with that as a career goal before they've taken any tests, let alone their board tests. So uh, this was uh, very hurtful, uh, clearly was a mistake. And it actually was filled with several misstatements of fact and misinterpretations of data in previous papers. So several of us, we got together a team and we wrote the editors. We pointed those misstatements of fact out to them. They cross-checked and agreed with us and they retracted the article. What I didn't know at the time, and maybe you knew this and, and I didn't, maybe I was the one who didn't know. I used to think that when an article is retracted, that it's poof, it's gone from the universe, you know, erased and you can't see it anymore. I find out uh, in talking with these editors that that's not true. Um, at least it's not true anymore. This paper, you can still find it indexed on PubMed and you can click on the link that will take you to the archives of the Journal of the American Heart Association and you can read the paper in its entirety. But the words retracted are written lightly across each page. So we wrote a rebuttal uh, to this and interestingly, uh, they rejected our rebuttal several times because we were mentioning the Wong paper, the Wang paper. And they said, no, 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 don't mention it because we've already retracted it. So don't make any mention of it. So, so our rebuttal, which now is not really a rebuttal, it's a standalone uh, argument in defense of diversity in cardiology. But I take you through all that to tell you when we ask the question, well, if we all know diversity makes us better, why aren't we there yet? Well, we don't all seem to know it. And we don't all agree. We don't have a consensus. Um, but I want to spend the rest of the time talking about what you can do, what I can do, what Case Western can do, what UT Southwestern can do, what Ohio State can do, and all of the AAMC. Uh, it's simple. Recruit, recruit, recruit. Because of uh, structural bias and structural racism in our society, the numbers, the sheer numbers of minorities that are ready and prepared to apply to medical school are in low supply. So we've got to recruit and we've got to go way back, go deep in the supply chain. Uh, we also though have to recruit from the immediate supply chain, the people that are right around the corner, like college students, pre-med students uh, and medical students. So deep in the supply chain, and I mean, go all the way back to kindergarten if we have to, recruiting doctors and more immediate in the supply chain, we need to identify bias when we see it, call it out, and then train ourselves and each other on how to overcome that bias, whether it's individual bias or bias in our structures. We need to elevate diversity competency. So the ability to treat in a humane way people who come from a group other than your group, we call that diversity competency. What if we elevated that on the list of priorities that we make when we're recruiting faculty, when we're recruiting medical students, when we are recruiting um, uh, residents and fellows. I'm not saying make it the number one consideration, but maybe it shouldn't be 10 out of 10, maybe elevate it to maybe a top three or top four or top five consideration. Um, and then finally, you and I need to act. So it's not enough to just speak, but act and be role models for those coming after us, be an activist against structural and societal bias and racism and adverse uh, uh, social determinants of health that you heard mentioned before. So 
Here's what I'd like to uh, uh, do. I wanna uh, end up now with some good news showing you things that you and I can do. Uh, I wanna end this on a positive note. Um, and I'm gonna bet you, I'm not sure what other slides you're gonna see today, but I'm gonna make this statement. I bet this is the, uh, this is the best slide you're gonna see all day. Look at this white coat ceremony. These are kindergartners. These are kindergartners in the, um, uh, in the K through 12 Health Sciences Academy uh, in Columbus, Ohio. It's a joint venture between the Ohio State University Medical Center and Columbus City Schools. So that from kindergarten through the 12th grade, these students will have the health sciences introduced to them in their curriculum. And get this, three times a year, they are going to meet and have a panel discussion with medical students, dental students, pharmacy students, nursing students, and imagine that by the time they get to be in the 12th grade, the idea of becoming a doctor to them, is gonna be no big deal because they've been interacting with doctors since kindergarten. This is an example of what we can all do. You don't have to necessarily make a K through 12 Health Sciences Academy, but every what if every one of those 150 or 160 AAMC medical schools had a relationship with their local elementary schools and high schools? That is the kind of recruiting in the deep supply chain that we need. Uh, recruit from the immediate supply chain. Uh, one of the projects uh, with the ACC's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, of which I'm most proud, is our internal medicine mentoring program. So internal medicine is the uh, specialty immediately before cardiology. And so we have mentoring groups of internal medicine residents who belong to the groups that are the most underrepresented in cardiology. Blacks, women, Hispanics, and now our new cohort, those who identify as LGBTQ+. We want more cardiologists of these backgrounds, so we are mentoring them to become uh, the most competitive cardiology fellowship applicants they can be. We hook them up with an ACC mentor that they meet with quarterly. Uh, they get to hear from program directors twice a year, and the most expensive part of it is we fly them all to the ACC meeting. Um, and this is one of my uh, favorite selfies now because this was at ACC 22 and you see standing behind me, 300 women, Hispanic and black internal medicine residents who aspire to be cardiologists. So we're truly trying to change the face of cardiology. This is recruiting from the immediate pipeline. And what a wonderful thing for a specialty society to do. So think about your specialty and your major specialty society we uh, challenge and would like to help other societies do the same thing. Three, identify and mitigate bias uh, in medicine and the selection processes. Uh, you've heard from Dr. Gerson that we did uh, an experiment uh, at the Ohio State University College of Medicine when I was a Dean of Admissions where we had our entire admissions committee take implicit association tests. And we discovered that the majority, more than 50% have unconscious negative biases about black people about women and about members of the LGBTQ plus community. That's the bad news. The good news is after showing them that data, we went right into a bias mitigation workshop where we practiced and rehearsed bias mitigation strategies. The next class that was admitted, the most diverse class in the history of the Ohio State University College of Medicine. So good people like me, and good people like you have unconscious biases, but the good news is we can override those with some very simple strategies. We've also started uh, here at UT Southwestern what we call bias and equity teaching rounds where quarterly at our internal medicine grand rounds, we discuss not patient complications, but instances of bias or racism that were heard in the process of taking care of patients or instances where someone thinks that bias or racism might have impacted patient care. We discuss it in a de-identified manner, and we then talk about um, evidence-based strategies to prevent them in the future. We've got to call out bias and learn from it so that we can get better. Number four, what if we elevated diversity competency? In this uh, opinion piece that we uh, entitled Black Lives Matter and the Cath Lab 2, we talked about our selection process for interventional cardiology fellows when I was the program director at The Ohio State University. Uh, we had a point score system. So of all our hundreds of applicants, 
we rated them on a simple point score system. You got equal points for clinical skills, collegiality, academic curiosity, leadership potential, and that diversity competency. So the likelihood that you would be a champion for health equity in interventional cardiology. When you use a system like this, it is one uh, strategy that can help you select for diversity. And let me make something clear. That diversity competency doesn't matter your race or ethnicity. You can have the whitest skin, the blondest hair, and the bluest eyes, but you could be somebody who has done a scholarly project on health inequities. You could be someone who is experienced in serving the underserved. You could be someone who has thought deeply about uh, communities other than your own. But we use this method and it is one reason why we had such a diverse interventional cardiology fellowship program. Every year for eight years in a row, at least one of our three interventional fellows belong to a group underrepresented in medicine. So we know the blueprint. These are the things that we all can do. And then finally, being an activist. Think about those social determinants of health. They're also social determinants of success. Imagine you're a kid that wants to be a doctor. And every three years, your family moves. And hunger is your constant companion. Your schools are overcrowded and underfunded. And your family transportation is unreliable, so you can't go to the after-school program about science and math. What are the chances that that child is going to be a doctor? Sometimes thinking about these social determinants of health and success can make us feel helpless but we're not helpless. There are some things that we can do, whether it's taking a knee for George Floyd or marching uh, so that prices for drugs, prescription drugs come down, um, using revolutionary art, using your pen and your pulpit to speak out, or you can be like these medical students at UT Southwestern and register people to vote. What a wonderful thing for a hospital to do, making sure that your uh, patients coming in and out of hospital uh, are registered to vote. Um, in conclusion, enhancing diversity will make us better. It will advance health equity, improve health care for all, and enhance the impact of our research. You and I can do this. There's a blueprint. We can follow that blueprint, but it all starts with your believing that diversity really does enhance quality. And I'll finish with one of my most uh, uh, favorite quotes from one of my favorite men. I, I like this picture of Dr. King because unlike many pictures of him where he looks very pensive and or maybe he's marching and singing, here he looks a little miffed. He, he looks uh, angry uh, as, uh, as I think about this quote of all the forms of inequality and justice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. And I like to think he is pointing at you and he's pointing at me because he expects us to do something about it. And uh, I'm proud to be uh, back in my uh, birth city, so to speak, even if it's virtual, to have this conversation with you. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Wow. Outstanding job, Dr. Capers. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. Outstanding, outstanding. We thank you for your contribution to in doing this work. What wonderful work you have done, and we certainly appreciate it. We want to open up at this time and ask if you have questions, feel free to place them in the chat or um, jump right in. Dr. Uh, Gerson, you, I know you unmuted yourself. Well, I was gonna, first of all, thank you for a very insightful and remarkably positive perception on the, on the difficulties that we all face in academic medicine. And uh, any of us should recognize an experience that uh, when we're interacting with our patients of a different background and perspective, we certainly want to look for those connectivities any way that we can. And um, I'm, I'm curious because you, you create a real advocacy here, but you've also had some successes. And I wonder if you could give us an example of a success uh, in this space. Well, so, so there are several. Uh, and one is, is actually, uh, I'll say at the uh, societal level. So, so I'd, I'd ask everybody here uh, who is a physician, if you're not a physician, you're working in a field 
think about your national uh, society, the American College of Gastroenterology, the American College of Rheumatology, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the American College of Cardiology, and think about what they can do. And think about how they, even though they're not specifically academic medicine, how they can help with this problem by reaching out to the pipeline and working with you to bring uh, these people from underrepresented groups uh, into the pipeline, into the meeting, to help diversify that specialty. That uh, certainly appears for us in the American College of Cardiology to be uh, a significant success story because we've got, uh, you know, we especially with our, you know, I told you we've got a black cohort, an Hispanic cohort, a cohort of women, and a cohort of people who identify as LGBTQ plus. And our black cohort, internal medicine residents who want to be cardiologists, ninety percent of them are first generation college students. So they're the first in their families to go to college. So certainly they're the first to go to medical school or residency or think about being a heart doctor. And so giving them advice, whereas very often they might be the resident that kind of stands in the back, that doesn't ask questions, that doesn't raise their hand in class because they just, uh, they just haven't had the things that would give them that kind of confidence. So for us to take it to them uh, and then help make them a competitive applicant uh, is, uh, is I think for sure uh, a success. But also uh, another success is, as I told you, once we pointed out to our admissions committee that, hey, good people have unconscious negative biases uh, uh, about race, about gender, uh, about religion, et cetera. But the good news is you can overcome that. There's some real easy strategies to do that. And once we trained them, it appears our research showed that they interacted with interviewees in a different way that made those interviewees feel like this is a really inclusive climate and uh, you know, as a result now, the Ohio State University, um, uh, not solely because of our bias mitigation training, which is now an annual requirement for the admissions committee, but because of, uh, that's one reason we think that we are, uh, I'm, I'm still saying we, I still got that Buckeye in my blood. I'm now at University of Texas Southwestern, but it's one reason that Ohio State is one of the most diverse medical schools uh, in the country. So those are, those are a couple of successes that we think are, are easily uh, reproducible. Dr. Capers, can you share the name of that bias training again? Uh, so which which uh, training, uh, Tina, are you talking about? Um, so, so, so the online test that online you can test, take okay. that, that, that's free and publicly available is called the Implicit Association Test, yes. IAT. Yes. It's free. Uh, and one thing we always tell people, you will be the only one who gets your results. So you don't have to worry that, uh oh, my department chair is going to get my results. It'll just be you. Um, but it is a worthwhile and very interesting activity that helps to uncover what are some of your unconscious biases that, that you are not aware of. Yes, thank you. Philip, I see your hand is up. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Capers. This has been a fantastic talk. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, the first is, um, if you've given any thought to the, um, what is it, the Harvard and Chapel Hill uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Students for Fair Admissions, um, and how we might preemptively, how we might think about the possible impact of that case and how we might overcome the impact of that case. And then the second question is um, related to the US News and World Reports where schools are beginning to opt out of kind of this ranking um, and whether or not that might have an impact on the potential diversification um, of this pathway into and through uh, medicine and medical leadership. Thank you. So, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Philip. I appreciate you tuning in and, and thank you for the question. So I'll start with your second part uh, first, the US News and World Report, and I've seen and followed online the uh, medical schools that are dropping out. I am applauding that. I, I think that's very positive, and I'll tell you why. Um, um, even outside of diversity, uh, I have, I'm old enough, I'm old enough that I remember when they started doing it. And I remember when they first started doing it, medical schools were offended. Medical schools were offended, how dare you this second rate news magazine uh, uh, rate us medical schools. I'm not gonna participate. And I've watched it go from that to its current state where boards of trustees and presidents are hiring medical school deans with the marching orders. I want us to climb 
in that US News and World Report ranking. And it has changed uh, how medical schools operate just so they can climb that ranking, uh, which has nothing to do with providing health care that improves people's lives. And if you get to the diversity argument, um, uh, the, the, the things that they go for have nothing to do with diversity. Now, I will give them credit that two years ago, they started also having a, a diversity ranking. But then for whatever reason, they made that kind of hidden. Like, I don't know, you had to be a member in order to see that. Um, I think that it was forcing medical schools in order to climb the rankings to do some things that ultimately could be anti-diversity. So I applaud very prestigious medical schools uh, like Harvard and I believe Stanford, and I think they were over the weekend, I say maybe they were up to nine or 10. I applaud them uh, pulling out. There's plenty, uh, the AAMC, MSAR, there are plenty of things for the prospective medical student to see, do I wanna go to this school? What's their curriculum like? What are their hospitals like? What are their research opportunities like? There's plenty out there already. Uh, and so I, uh, I really applaud that move. And the first part is something that, that, that keeps me up at night. And that is, uh, yes, I'm following with interest the Harvard and North Carolina cases. Um, and uh, I don't have a good feeling, especially with the current makeup of the Supreme Court. It is quite likely that within uh, a few months from now, we will uh, have an end to the ability to consider race as one, um, one criteria that you look at when you're making higher education admissions. In terms of being proactive, uh, if that is to come, there are several things that you can do. You know, you, you might be aware that there were already uh, nine or so states that had a state-driven mandate and vote to outlaw looking at race and higher education admissions. California is one of those states. And so what they did in California to combat that is they said, well, we'll just replace race with socioeconomic status. Because so very often that goes along with being an underrepresented minority, but not in every case. And so uh, what has happened is you saw a big dip in the diversity in the California public schools uh, after that proposition went through. And it came up a little bit when they substituted socioeconomic status, but it never reached its pre-levels. And so I think we can try to come up with surrogates that might help a little bit, uh, but I think it will be very uh, damaging uh, if we're not allowed to consider race as one factor. I mean, you can have 20 factors and race is just one of them because in this country, in this society, your race can impact how much education you've been allowed to have or the quality of that education. So to not take that into consideration to me seems wrongheaded. So uh, I, am, I am concerned about that. Let me just say this though, ending on a positive note, uh, no matter how that vote goes, we are rolling up our sleeves and ready to work. Yes, we are rolling up our sleeves. Thank you for that. So the, the question I asked earlier, Dr. Capers, was regarding the training for the admissions committee after the IAT um, results. Yes, so, so that, was, that, that was homegrown. So, so I had been trained to be a, an implicit bias mitigation workshop leader. Mm -hmm. And so I was the dean of admissions. And so I led those. Um, and uh, now that I have uh, moved on, um, uh, they have several different people at Ohio State that are using those, but we, um, we, we found them to be very helpful and, and think that all selection committees, whether it's residency or fellowship, you know, GME training program selection committees, all admissions committees, all faculty search committees should get implicit bias mitigation training. And it's uh, here at UT Southwestern, we are training the trainers. So we're training, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reproducing myself, you know, 30 times over so that we have more people that can uh, give these trainings because we think it's it, now, it's only one part. You can't do that and then nothing else. But right. it is one important part of trying to diversify your, your medical center. Great. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Capers? Yes, sir. If I could just bring our attention to a couple of the questions in the chat. Um, Thank you. One of them is... Uh, you know, given the number of people on this call and how many could benefit from this call, um, how can we reach more people and get others to hear and involved in these efforts? Well, um, uh, that's a good question. So uh, I think I did hear earlier, though, that, that this is uh, being recorded. Um, and so hopefully you can use those, use this for educational purposes. 
But now that you all, uh, and you know, I'm not kidding myself, maybe you all had it even before this meeting, but now that you have um, uh, an evidence supported argument in the case of diversity as one strategy to achieve health equity, you now will be the ambassadors and go out and talk to your colleagues and your classmates. And, um, and, and again, uh, the literature is there. So this is not just my opinion, it's not just your opinion, but uh, we can hopefully help to reach out to our colleagues by saying there is evidence that diversity yes. is gonna make medicine better. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you. This was outstanding. I have a quick question. I'm um, Cindy Kaboom, currently serving as the vice dean for our faculty. And I'll tell you something that I struggle with, and I would appreciate your thoughts on this, is the minority tax. And how do we address that without contributing to it and creating further disparities for minority faculty because the greater service demands makes it harder and harder for them to meet these other job demands, right? And so um, I've tried to balance that with kind of allyship, but then I don't know, but then am I, are we opening it up so that we're getting the true diversity that we need to do the best work we can? So any thoughts you have regarding that, I'd appreciate any words of wisdom, because I think it's a real problem that a lot of our minority faculty grapple with day in, day out. So, uh, thank you so very much. It is such, such an important question, especially when we're talking about this. Um, and. and and, and, and to be clear, you know, when minority, you know, when your minority faculty member is tapped to go have dinner with the minority candidates and to talk to the students um, and to talk to the trainees, and you know, when you keep tapping them, I, I think to be uh, clear, we should they want to do that, right? It's in their heart to do that. But you're absolutely right. If they're on the tenure track and they're hired to get an NIH grant so they can study this gene and pulmonary hypertension. But if they're always being pulled to do these things, and then they're not doing their experiments that lead to their grant, then that actually hurts them. Um, and so uh, the best way, in my opinion, to combat that minority tax is to compensate that work. Now, when I say compensation, people usually immediately go to dollars and salary. That's not a bad thing, but also to compensate it in terms of P&T credit. And uh, we've just launched, uh, we have four faculty tracks for promotion at UT Southwestern, we just launched a fifth. It's our clinician track, and it's for those who spend 90% of their time in direct patient care, but there are uh, steps to be promoted from assistant to associate to full professor. We now have in this track, and I wanna try to fit it in the other tracks, um, you actually get promotion and tenure credit for activities that enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in other words, to be specific, to be promoted on that track, you have to meet two criteria. You have to show that you are excellent clinically, and then you have to do one other thing, and there's a list of other things, and one of them on that list is activities that support or enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you're doing that and you're clinically excellent, that will get you promoted. So uh, the way I think to soften the burden of the minority tax is to compensate them either with you know, true compensation, or um, uh, let them use that in their p and portfolio so that they can get promoted. And, you know, why shouldn't it be if you think about it? It's helping the medical center and it's helping the, uh, it's helping medicine to make medicine better. So if you've got somebody that's uh, going to a church pulpit and talking to the uh, people in the church about how to avoid a stroke, um, if you've got somebody that's going to career day at the schools, talking to youngsters about uh, the career of being a doctor and who's mentoring your students, why shouldn't why shouldn't that get them promoted? They're doing something that is truly helping not only the medical center but the world. So uh, compensation, compensate them either with money or PNT credit. Excellent. Yeah, and I think Australia has argued for that as well in terms of the Australian Academy of Scientists. So I oh. think there's there's opportunity there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Capers. Thank you, Cynthia. Other questions? Other questions? Well, we are at time. Dr. Capers, it is 139. Outstanding job. 
We applaud you. We thank you for your contribution again to academic medicine and doing this work. We definitely will use this recording to educate and further the work here in the School of Medicine. We do have a group of inclusive leaders that are at the table doing the work. And so we are thankful for that. And, um, and we look forward to having you again. So on behalf of the School of Medicine, um, Dr. Gerson and all of the, the vice deans and the entire school, we just thank you and appreciate your work. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye, everyone.